Hello and welcome to our webinar today. We're going to be talking about the Center for Science in the Public Interest New Report, Rigged, Supermarket Shelf for Sale. I'm Jessica Almy. I'll be doing the introduction. And then Gary Rivlin, um, the investigative reporter, is the research he'll be um, So to get started, um, you should be on mute right now. Um, if you want to ask questions, use the chat box um, on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction about the Center for Science and Public Interest and why this investigation matters. And then Gary's going to talk about how he investigated this report, what the top findings were, and, um, and then we're going to go into recommendations and we'll take questions from the audience. Again, if you want to um, post questions, use the chat box. So the Center for Science and the Public Interest is, has been around since 1971, and we work to make it easier for Americans to eat healthfully. And we do that um, in a number of ways, including improving the food environment. Our goal is to prevent and mitigate diet and obesity-related diseases. You may be familiar with our consumer-facing magazine, Nutrition Action Health Letter. If you don't subscribe yet, please go do so. We also um, put out books and reports like this one, and we work on national, state, and local policies um, to improve school foods and a number of other things. So some of the nutrition policy issues that we work on here at CSPI are focused on um, school lunch and breakfast programs and competitive foods, which are the kinds of foods that compete against the school lunch and breakfast programs, so the a la carte line and um, spending. We also work to um, ensure that customers have information on menus about calories, and that will be, um, be rolled out in all chain restaurants nationwide very soon. We work to improve the healthfulness of public properties like city halls and um, vending machines on government property, as well as parks. Um, and we focus on food marketing to kids, which includes not just what you think of as advertising, but also the use of characters on packages to sell particular foods to kids. Um, and in-school marketing, as well as restaurant children's meals, which are a form of marketing. And we also focus on healthy checkout, which is um, very relevant to our discussion today. So CSPI is sort of at the um, work hard on the good food movement and um, to improve food environments. So why do we think about the supermarket? People make different choices based on what's available to them and how choices are presented. A few examples from other kinds of um, venues. At one Subway sandwich shop, um, people received a short menu and a long menu at lunch. The short menu highlighted the lowest calorie sandwiches, and the longer menu had more choices. Um, and people were 48% more likely to choose a low-calorie sandwich than if they got the shorter menu than if they got the mixed menu. In another study serving adults several small portions of broccoli, carrots, and peas rather than a larger portion of a single vegetable increased their veg vegetable consumption by half a serving. So it matters how choices are presented to people. And the supermarket is not a neutral setting. So supermarkets use floor plans like the one you see see on your screen right now to indicate which products are purchased most frequently or to map the flow of traffic throughout the store. And then they put things in the particular places that um, drive purchases, like the displays closest to the doors. Basically, you can put anything there and it'll sell. So, you know, it doesn't make sense that supermarkets would be neutral. A random assortment of products throughout the store wouldn't be efficient for anyone, the people stocking it, the people shopping it, or the companies that want to, want to sell their products. Um, so we wanted to ask what influences which products stores favor through preferential treatment. And that really is the focus of the report that we're going to be talking about today. And it matters because the way that choices are presented uh, influences what people eat and obviously what people um, eat influences their long-term patterns of health. We know that the causes of obesity are complex. It's not just about the way that stores are laid out. But if you're asking yourself, why care about an impulse buy of a 250-calorie candy bar, keep in mind that the American obesity epidemic is estimated to be due to an excess of about 100 calories per day for adults and 64 calories for children. So those small incremental impulse buys do matter to people's long-term health. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker today, Gary Rivlin, who's an investigative reporter who has 
um, worked for the New York Times, has published a number of books, including his most recent book about the rebuilding of New Orleans after Katrina. Um, we were honored and delighted to partner with him on this project, and um, I hope you'll be interested in it today. So, Gary, over to you. Thanks, Jessica, and um, thank you, everyone listening, for your, your interest. You know, I, I, I've been a journalist for more than 30 plus years, but I'll confess up front that um, all those years I never really covered food, grocery stores, nutrition. Um, but in a way that ended up being a blessing. When I first heard about this was uh, two summers ago. Uh, I actually approached a, a former colleague of mine who, who covered food saying, hey, you'd probably be interested in this. And she pointed out that for her work as a journalist, she's always quoting Center for Science and Public Interest and other folks, and it would be a conflict. Um, you know, every time she'd quote CSPI, she'd have to like note that she had a relationship with it. So, you know, in the, for, for me, uh, it meant uh, an ability to really just do this research and not worry that it was going to close doors for me or anything uh, like that. And it, another big piece here is I, I've been a business reporter at the New York Times and, and other places for a long time, and I, I just was absolutely fascinated by this idea of a grocery store as a, a real estate play, uh, very counterintuitive the way I think as a consumer as a grocery store. So it was very easy for me to, to get into this despite not really having much, uh, despite having no background uh, as a journalist uh, at, at least. Um, you know, I started almost exactly a year ago. Jessica, others at CSPI got me started with some materials, a, a pair of FTC reports from the early 2000s, a few papers in places like the Journal of Law and Commerce. And you know, I did a little bit of web research, uh, literature search. And I, uh, the first realization is I was shocked at how little had been written on this. You read the FTC report, and they talk about, this is uh, 2001, 2003, they talk about how important this is, how essential this is to the, the, the US diet, um, yet food makers, uh, uh, supermarkets weren't participating with them, so they just threw up their hands and said, well, it's an important topic, but uh, no one's talking to us, so they just, they just moved, they moved on. Um, you know, one of the things I learned very early on in one of my first interviews, uh, somebody told me, oh, you'll never get this. This is one of the deep, dark secrets uh, of, of, of retail, which basically kind of set up a good challenge um, uh, for me. So. Um, First thing I did. I, first thing I did after um, after doing my reading is call a former colleague of mine, Michael Moss. Um, and you know, certainly these placement fees played a big factor in the salt, sugar, and fat uh, in our in our di in our diet. Is one way to use this subtitle. Have food giants hook us? But he kind of loved the question. He loved the idea of getting to the bottom of it. But he hadn't looked at it, and he didn't know anyone really who, who had. He gave me a few anecdotal stories, but there wasn't, there wasn't much. And the way it works in investigative journalism is you're always using one fact to get more facts. Um, so I combed through the FTC papers and stuff, and there are little pieces there. You know, it's, it's, it said in the FTC 2003 report that uh, it cost about $20,000 to get a new product into a, a single chain. And so I would just use that number, like, does that sound right to you? Is it higher? Is it, is it lower? And as I was getting more facts, triangulate and try to reach conclusions about how much different things would cost, which I'll get into in a little, a little bit. Um, so CSPI gave me the names of a few uh, sympathetic insiders, people who uh, work in the industry on either side as a, uh, for, a, for a retailer or a, or a food manufacturer and you know that that was helpful especially as far as getting more names and such but early on I realized that the key was to be talking to food brokers uh, these are the people who the food makers hire uh, to negotiate with the big food chain the the, the biggest companies the coca colas of the world they, they do this in-house but you know anyone else um, is going to be hiring a, a broker uh, most likely I, I ended up talking to for them, um, five if you include this guy who specialized in the convenience uh, stores, and you know it's it's 
they argued with me. They didn't like what I was doing. They insisted on anonymity, but you know, it, it ended up really being um, being helpful in, in in getting the numbers I'm about to about to present. Um, but before I go further, just one definitional definitional note. Um, early on, I was interchangeably using placement fees, slotting. Uh, Fees, but it was important talking to the brokers and talking others within the industry to be precise, and I'll try to do that here. Uh, slotting fees uh, technically mean the fee paid on a new product, the, court, the cost of the store to slot the item to create a SKU, make room on the shelf. Uh, a, a second category of fee is the pay-to-stay fee. Once you're on the shelf and you want to continue staying on that shelf, you want to continue staying. Um, in a prominent spot, you're going to keep on on paying. So slotting fees is for a new product. Placement fees is the more uh, is the umbrella term for all these kinds of of of, of, uh, of fees. Um, early on, I, I you, know, you take several paths at once. I'm calling. I'm looking for brokers who might talk to me. I'm talking to experts. But early on, um, I I spoke to this fellow uh, John John Gordon. Um, uh, I, I learned his name from uh, from CSPI. Uh, Mike Jacobson and, and John had had spoken, and you know, it, 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 briefly, uh, Gordon was a ice cream fanatic, self-described ice cream fanatic, pint a day, and in the late 1990s, uh, is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Told he has to give up ice cream, doesn't want to do that, and creates this sugar-free ice cream, a line of sugar-free ice cream products. He called. Uh, Clemmies, and you know, by the time I had talked to him, this was years uh, later. It was more than ten years later after he had founded uh, Clemmies, and you know, early on he got really good reviews. The the, the bloggers and such uh, talked about it. You know, it was a really good tasting product. You're not really giving up much without the the sugar. And he started getting into the the stores. Safeway. He was on the West Coast. Safeway was was interested. But this is what he learned about slotting fees, or the term he would use is payola, the cash you'd have to get, they have to uh, fork over uh, to get into the store. And, and, and Gordon was really great. We spent a lot of time on the phone because he had the details. He knew how much the various chains uh, were asking uh, to get into the, the store. So he's coming in with an ice cream, which is the domain of two food giants. In fact, there are 24 freezer doors at the store nearest his his home, and he counted 22 were dominated by Nestle's, which is Haagen Dazs, Dreyer's, and Edie's, or Unilever, which is Ben and Jerry's, Breyer's, Klondike. Um, and so there's not very much uh, space uh, for everyone else. Uh, he talks to Albertsons, and Albertson said, "Okay, thirty thousand dollars, but we'll only put you in a, a small uh, fraction of our stores." He talks talks to Ahold, which is uh, Stop and Shop and other other uh, stores, um, and they want $110,000 per SKU. And at that point, he had five flavors, so it's talking about a half a million dollars, which he said no to. And he, he looked for places where he could get in for 20,000 per SKU, 40,000 uh, per SKU. But then he learned the payments didn't stop there. It's one thing to pay to get into the store, but you know now we're moving to pay to to stay. And these are stores asking for cash or more commonly uh, free product. You could stay on. You could stay in the freezer, uh, uh, John Gordon, uh, but you need to give us two or three boxes for free per store. And you know he ca he calculated that that's forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars for every retailer with a thousand stores. He asked about getting into the circular, uh, you know, the the thing they give out at the store, or, or getting into the ads. Uh, hey, sugar-free product, you might want to buy this. And he was just told you can't even play there. That's that's just for as he put it, the big. Uh, the big boys. Um, he calculated that over the years he spent a million dollars, uh, more than a million dollars, uh, on these on these various kinds of fees. And shortly after I talked to him, he was in nine, ten thousand stores. By the time I talked to him, he was in a fraction of that. A few months after we spoke, he ended up declaring bankruptcy. And I, I just always used him as a point of reference. And in a way, he was my first big lesson. Uh, about this world, I, I learned so much um, from him. And the, the story of the in the report, I, I, I use uh, uh, Clemmies to both open the report and we come back to to them uh, a couple of 
time. I, I, you know, I also, while I was going, talked to public health experts to find out why this is uh, important, you know, policy types. I spoke to about a half dozen smaller makers who are making healthier for you products. Several said they'd talk on the record, but by the time we got to the fact-checking phase, only one, Daniel Lebetsky from uh, Kind Bar, uh, would actually allow his name to be used. They were scared. They were scared of repercussions from the retailers giving, these, giving out these, these numbers. So a couple of things before I delve in. One, I learned there's different prices. Uh, for different parts of, of the store, even, even different parts of the back of the store. I mean, there's the checkout counter and other specialty places. But the freezer cabinet, for instance, is more expensive than the condiment uh, aisle. Some of that is just supply and demand that there's less uh, freezer cabinet space than uh, shelf space. And you know, another thing, too, and this might have been just my own approach, is it's really important to me to have the narrative arc. I want to know when did these things start it? I mean, we didn't always have slotting fees. We didn't always have placement fees. And this name, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Herb Sorensen from Scientific Shopper. He told me it was the AMP in the 70s um, that started. But via LinkedIn, I found this guy who had worked it for ShopRite in the 70s and 80s. And he was there at ShopRite uh, when, they, when they started. It was a AMP a year or two later. Uh, who who copied them? And you know, for for me, I, I really like this idea of going from this smaller side business. It was just something to cover their costs. And the way this fellow from Shoprite put it, it cost us time and effort to introduce new products. A lot of food makers are just throwing stuff at the wall, didn't care if it worked or not. Uh, no no cost to them. And just to add some discipline. But then it turned into this multi-billion dollar business. And I wanted to figure out, you know, the arc of that, how it how it happened. Um, so let's let's kind of get down to the the, the details. Um, so the, the checkout lane, uh, the beachfront property as one of my brokers uh, called it. Typically the most expensive um, uh, placement in, in a store. I mean some of it's obvious, it's just uh, very little space. Uh, on top of that, it's dominated um, by the large chip and candy uh, makers. Um, if you're going to want to knock M&Ms out, you have to have a product that really uh, sells. But I really just, I, I really became obsessed almost with how much would it cost. And I came up, I decided to come up with this concrete way of trying to get a number. Okay, I've got a better for you bar. Um, that I want by the checkout counter because I'm convinced it's going to sell. How much is it going to cost? Me? How much is it going to cost me? And so, uh, with my different brokers, I, I asked them uh, that. And, you know, I got different numbers. You know, three dollars per inch. I should back up that um, I, I learned that uh, I was I was actually asking for a candy caddy to use the the term of art. It's basically a, a six inch space. So you're paying by the inch. And the first guy I spoke to said, oh, it would be about $3 an inch, I mean, some, some change charge more than others. But on average, uh, $3, and, uh, $3 an inch. Talked to a couple others, and they said, no, nah, it could be $3 an inch, but it's closer to $5 an inch. And you, know, you, you, do the, you do the math on that. And you look at a chain like Kroger's, the, the largest, with um, almost 3,000 stores, and if you want to be in the checkout aisle in all their stores across the country with your Better For You bar or whatever, uh, it's going to cost you know, upwards of three quarters of a million dollars. And the amazing part is uh, that buys you a chance. You get a month or two, but if your product is bombing, too bad you're knocked out and there's somebody else, uh, somebody else coming in. If you look at the 50 largest chains, if I want my Better For You bar uh, in the 50 largest chains in the country. We're talking about upwards of $5 million, uh, which is obviously out of reach to all but the biggest food makers. This is a key place where there's a lot of impulse buys. One of my food brokers told me that candy makers about half their profit uh, from the impulse buys at the, at the checkout uh, counter, yet prohibitive, prohibitively uh, expensive. So then the end cap typically the second most expensive um, uh, property inside a, a store. And, you know, these, these are the end of the aisle displays where, again, there's a lot of impulse 
uh, buying every every food maker uh, wants to take their turn on on an end cap, but you know who can afford it? Here it's a little bit different. You're not paying by the inch; you're paying by the in quotes events. You know the the the, the back to school, Halloween. You know there's different events. There's you know just the in between stuff that hey we are going to put this stuff on 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 special. And so again, I, I turn to my my brokers to get a sense, pretending I'm a, a food maker, I want to be in these spots, how much is it going to cost me? And you know, one example I got is that uh, this broker had just done a deal at a, a smaller chain of about 300 stores, and for a one-time event, uh, just to be on the end cap for a couple of few weeks, would have been $17,000 for the one, the one shelf. They're, of course, selling all the shelves uh, there. He gave me a second example, or somebody else gave me a second Second example of Publix, uh, which is about a thousand stores, and they said it's about seventy-five thousand dollars per event. Again, just to be on that shelf for a few weeks, and at a place like Publix, and I'm sure most of the others, uh, there's a minimum. Uh, he said the minimum is about one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars at Publix. In other words, you can't just buy one event; you have to buy a package of events. They prefer six to eight per year, uh, but there'll be a minimum of a few. Uh, events and you know you do the math on that it works out to about sixty dollars per store but again there's thirty eight thousand supermarkets uh, in the u s and so if you want your product for a single event a single couple of week period uh, at this play uh, at, on an end cap it's going to cost you a couple of million two million uh, dollars uh, in fact I, I talked to a former executive for one of the big food chains and he said really that seventy five thousand dollar num number per event for the the public you really need to double that uh, because if you're going to be on that end cap, um, uh, the stores want to make sure they're really selling there. So they're going to want you to put a 30% off, two for one special, other th other things to draw people to the store, so they can really capitalize on your being uh, at that spot. And you, the food maker, are paying for the the lion's share of that 30% off, the the two for one. So it's not really $75,000 he impressed upon me, but uh, $150,000. Um, you know, it's it's and then there's these other uh, special placements, shippers, just these cardboard displays, gondolas, uh, and all. I, I talked to this fellow who used to work at Coca-Cola, uh, and he talked about 360-degree marketing. Uh, their idea was that there'd be a dozen or more opportunities for you to buy your Coca-Cola. You know, a little box by the by the checkout, something by the uh, by the deli counter, uh, an end cap. You know, special in the aisle where where you have the the beverages and such. Um, but maybe the most shocking thing to me uh, was that it didn't just cost to get into the store. Uh, excuse me, it didn't just cost to get special placement in the store. It costs simply to get in the store and stay uh, on the the shelf. We're not just talking about placement fees to have a special placement at the end cap or checkout. Uh, but vir virtually every inch uh, of the store is for sale. There's a couple of exceptions. Um, uh, typically, you're not paying to have your product in produce. Um, the meat counter is is typically uh, not uh, not a place that's for sale. But pretty much, pretty much everywhere, everywhere else. And again, here's where you really see the difference in in prices uh, depending on the chain depending on where you want to be. So you want to be in the condiment section, uh, the, the typical uh, slotting fee uh, is going to be $5,000 to $20,000 per SKU. You've got three or four flavors, so suddenly it's fifteen to $80,000 um, uh, per SKU for a, single, for a single chain. You want to be in the freezer, it's going to cost more than that. In fact, I found a Frozen and Refrigerated Buyer in 2015, trade publication, uh, had a special issue uh, about uh, placement fees. And they spoke to a lot of frozen food makers, and, and they thought it would cost about $1.5 million uh, to get your new product uh, into, the, into the freezer. Again, $1.5 million for a, a single a single SKU, and then on top of that, there's state of play uh, fees in some parts of the the store, in some of the in some of the um, aisles. Um, I uh, another thing that was shocking was category captains. 
I never heard this term uh, in my my life. It was I first heard it from um, John Gordon uh, from 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 Clemens, and it it just seems insane. Uh, what most of the big chains do, in, in part just to save money, um, is they job out um, the task of planograms of designing. Uh, the shelves to the leading manufacturer in that category. So if it's uh, be Quaker in, in in cereals, it'd be Nestle typically in 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 frozen food, and they draw up the plan. And you know, from, from John Gordon, John Gordon's point of view, Clemmy's uh, point of view, um, you had stores. Uh, you, excuse me. You had category captains that were relegating him to unfavorable positions. You know, he went to a store near his home, and he was behind the hinge. You could barely see it. In the report, we have a picture of uh, his ice cream in the counter in the cabinet uh, behind a huge poster, obscured by a huge poster for a special on, on Haagen-Dazs. And you know, I, I, how this is legal by antitrust laws, I don't know. Um, but this might have been the most shocking thing, uh, shocking thing I, I, I learned. Um, you know, it, it's not just the supermarkets, uh, the convenience store, which of course a lot of product is is, is bought there. That's largely the same story. Um, there, the thing for sale is mainly uh, checkout. Uh, I spoke to this one broker. He was the one who would let me use his name, Joel Goldstein, you know, broker number five here, and he said, you know, there they charge by the week typically, so twenty five cents per dollar fifty per store per week, which again sounds like pennies until you start doing the math. I won't bother going over here. You go into the report and you see it quickly turns into the millions of dollars if you want your energy drink, your alternative healthier product uh, by, by checkout. Last thing I looked at was like the, the non-food stores, which are increasingly a player in, 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 um, in food sales. So you've got, you know, at Office Depot selling soda, chips, candy. Uh, and all. I mean, some of it on the shelf, some of it impulse buys when you're when you're a checkout. There, it's it's slightly different. They're not charging placement fees. They're just insisting on a much better price. So they're going to make their money um, by having you, the manufacturer, pay to be by the by the um, checkout stand. But uh, they're going to make their money by uh, making you slash your wholesale prices wholesale prices to them. So, um, you know, in, in, in journalism, we always talk about the, the, money, the money quote, the quote that sums it, sums it all up. And, you know, I, 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 I single out a few of them uh, here. They're highlighted in the, in the report. Uh, here's one from a marketing professor from the U University of Northern Florida, uh, North Florida. People have the reasonable assumption that a product is where it is on the shelf for reasons other than manufacturer paid a lot of money to put it there. Uh, someone else, this is Herb Sorensen, make no mistake, the supplier is the store's real customers. The suppliers need a store's customers and they're willing to pay for access to the traffic. But to me, the most apt quote um, uh, was from one of, my, one of my food brokers. And clearly, it's the grocery store buying product from the manufacturers, but what he told me is, you should sit in on, you should sit in on one of these negotiations. You would think that the stores were selling to the manufacturers rather than the other way around. He said that it, it's, it's just, it's incredible. Most of the discussion is not about what product do I want to pick up and how much will I pay for it. It's the uh, food makers talking about how much money they're going to spend for a variety of things from placement to uh, uh, being featured in the, in the store circulars and such. Which brings us to kind of the bigger numbers. Uh, here, so how much does a how much does a uh, store um, uh, how much is spent by manufacturers generally on placement fees? That's a really hard number to come by. I, I tried some back of it the envelope approaches. I talked to that marketing professor I mentioned before from the, the University of North, North Florida and others, and you know we, we figured it's clearly in the tens of billions. But this is a murky world. It's not like these are published any where uh, it's, it's not like it's transparent, like the, it's not like there's a menu uh, of, of prices. But the one thing that was easier to get is an overall number for what in the industry they would call 
trade span or promotional span. And that would be slotting fees, placement fees generally, but also the price of getting in the store circular, those discounts, two for one, 20% off, all those ways it's the manufacturer paying the store rather than, than vice uh, versa. There's a, a Goldman Sachs uh, report from November 2015 that said that uh, retailers, that includes food, beverage, um, uh, liquor, and um, tobacco, and household items. So not just food, food, beverage, household, and, and tobacco, uh, $200 billion in trade fees. Um, I tried with this professor at, at um, University of North Florida. We figured it's at least $50 billion in trade fees for just food and non-alcoholic um, beverage uh, makers. And how important is this uh, to, the, to the store? Uh, well, again, stores are t t tend not to be transparent about this, but Safeway, uh, until it went private last year, um, they would publish uh, what they collected in vendor spend. So again, that's slotting fees, but promotional fees more more generally. Uh, so slotting fees, pay to stay, but also these the cost of of um, the circulars and such. Um, in 2014, they brought in 2.5 billion dollars in vendor allowances, and that same year they made 113 million dollars. 2.5 billion in vendor allowances, and yet they only made 113 million dollars uh, in, in in profit. So. The fees we're talking about are essential uh, to the to the stores. They're arguably the number one source of profit uh, for the for the stores. Um, for me, I'm going to leave the kind of the bigger conclusions to Jessica and the folks at CSPI. But you know, one point that I think just informed this project from uh, the beginning. Early on, I did an interview with someone that you know pointed out to me that. Most of the innovation going on in um, in the food world, if we want to look at you know the newest food makers as the startups trying to disrupt uh, the market, uh, it, the opportunity is in healthier eating. People at least aspire to eat um, more healthy. And so one way you could look at this is the system is slanted towards the big players who not only don't mind paying these you know billions of dollars in sliding fees, they like it. And it's an advantage they have over the smaller players. It's a way to defend their turf, raising the bar for any new product that wants to get in. But it's not just big companies versus small companies. I think what's really important is we're talking about a huge hurdle in the way of new products and innovators trying to get in and make a healthier uh, a grocery store um, and the price to get in. Uh, is prohibitive. Uh, what, what Kind Bar did is they just took the slow and steady route. They went to the organic stores and alternative stores and got some progress, made a little bit of money, spent it um, on the cheaper placement fees. It's cheaper to be in the health food aisle than it would be to be in the candy bar aisle. So them and other better for you uh, food makers would go there because it was cheaper, but if you really want to get in uh, to the mainstream of the mainstream stores, you're writing millions, you know, multi-million dollar uh, check, and just seemed important that the system is rigged not just against smaller companies, but a lot of these businesses that are trying to help uh, Americans uh, eat uh, healthier. Thanks, Gary. So this is Jessica at CSPI. I um, want to just sort of close out the presentation, and then we'll take questions. So if you have questions, please submit them in the chat box. Um, but what really struck me when I read Gary's findings was that it's what ha what's happening in the supermarkets in America today is, is merely the illusion of choice. Um, we see all of these brands on the shelf. You look in the freezer cabinet and you see Breyers and you see haagen and you see Klondike. And then you realize that it's actually a few dozen companies that dominate all the food and beverage categories and usually only a couple in any given category. And then we find out that these placement fees determine which foods are in the store and where they are. Um, and that they're being paid by these few dozen companies. And, and suddenly, what seemed like choice initially no longer looks that way. You know, there's, it's no accident that um, 
you only see broccoli or apples in the produce section, but everywhere you turn in the supermarket, there's Coca-Cola. It's because what Gary said, produce doesn't pay for placement, but companies like Coke and Pepsi um, do. And so it really seems that the American supermarket is not utopia of choices um, that it otherwise looks to be. So we have some recommendations in the report. and be interested to hear people's thoughts. Um, we, have, we recommend that the Federal Trade Commission investigate um, these fees and the category captain system using the FTC Act and issuing subpoenas to the companies. We think this would get around the problem that the FTC previously experienced when it tried to get this information and couldn't find willing people to come forward. Um, and the FTC has used its subpoena power to promote public health in the past, investigating food marketing expenditures to children. We also recommend that the SEC require disclosure for publicly traded companies. Like Gary said, Safeway was an outlier. Most companies don't report um, how much they're spending on trade spend, and they certainly don't break it out to slotting fees, placement fees, um, and one-time events. We also uh, urge attorneys general to investigate whether this system, particularly category captains, um, violate state antitrust or consumer protection laws. Um, and we promote healthy checkout ordinances. We have um, a model bill on our web, linked on our website. Um, we've worked with Change Lab Solutions on language. So if you work in a community and you're interested in healthy checkout, get in touch with us. We'd love to work with you to introduce a healthy checkout ordinance. And then we ask the industry to do more to promote customer health. And Gary's report does have some examples of ways that's beginning to happen. Some of the better for you bars are being invited to be at checkout without having to pay. 7-Eleven um, is now selling many times more bananas than its best-selling uh, candy bar. And so uh, we urge companies both on the retail side and the food manufacturing side to step forward and use these um, backroom deals to promote customers' health rather than undermine it. And so with that, I will take questions. We've already had some submitted in the chat box, and um, you're welcome to submit more as we, as we go along. Um, the first question is for Gary, and it's about checkout. Um, one of the participants in today's webinar asks, um, is the amount that you talk about a one-time fee or, a, or for a certain amount of time at checkout? And um, do the companies need to pay at regular intervals to stay at checkout? Yeah, so it, these these deals are typically, I mean, there's no hard and fast answer to that. Uh, you know, there's many, many different chains. Everyone has their own way. Like I said, convenience stores do it by the week. Um, but, you know, for the for the most part, for the, the, the big supermarket chains, they're negotiating this annually. And so you're paying the, uh, this fee uh, annually. And again, as I mentioned, there's no guarantee that you're going to stay there all year. You're basically paying for your shot uh, to prove it, uh, to prove your, your, yourself, prove your product. Uh, so if your product is selling well, uh, the stores are making money above and beyond the, 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 the placement fee, uh, you'll continue to stay there. Uh, but you know, after a month or two, uh, this is premium real estate. If after a month or two uh, your product is proving a dud, no one's no one's grabbing it. Uh, they're selling very little volume. They're kicking you out, and they're they're selling that spot to someone else. Everybody wants that uh, spot. And again, uh, you just just next time you go to the store, you'll 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 see it's just the big candies are there. So if you're buying a spot, there's very few placements. And if you're in that spot. You're, you 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 win or you're out, and it's your tough luck that you wasted that wasted that money. So we have a lot of questions rolling in, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and I can tell there's some lawyers who are tuning in as well, but we'll get we'll get to those <laughs> legal questions in a moment. Um, here's another question for you, Gary: Is it just as expensive to get healthy options on the shelves of convenience and corner stores as it is in supermarkets? Uh, yeah, I you know I'll confess that most of my efforts were on the supermarket and did a little bit of research on the convenience convenience stores. Um, 
I, I, I do know uh, that the economics are similar for for checkout. You know, it's very expensive to get the checkout in a grocery in a supermarket, just like it is uh, in a convenience store. I really I don't really have a sense of the pricing, at least, on uh, getting your product onto a shelf. Uh, you know, wheat bread uh, in a in a in a in a uh, convenience uh, mark or a, a convenience market or a or a, a bodega kind of kind of place. One of the things um, that struck me in reading the report is the difference between the corporate stores and the independent or the um, franchise convenience stores. And you say in the report that the corporate stores are much more likely to follow planograms and, and have contracts in place than those um, franchise stores. There are a bunch of questions about sort of the differences across different store formats or different kinds of supermarkets, including questions about co-op versus corporate models of supermarkets. Um, and I wondered if you had any additional thoughts on that topic, Gary, if we should well, I mean, th there are different kinds of grocery stores. You know, I think maybe the most interesting example is Walmart. Uh, Walmart forever did not often charge placement fees. They would just insist on the best wholesale price they could get. But actually, while I was doing this report, um, they announced uh, that from now on, they are going to charge placement fees. So there was the one big exception, Walmart, which sells more uh, more food than any other store by a by, by long margin, um, had not participated uh, in this. But but now they they are. You could, you could read in the report their logic that they wanted to make the system fairer, uh, which I didn't quite understand. But, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, kind of the, the various deals, the various kinds of stores, yes, the convenience stores uh, if it's an independently owned one, you know, no, no one's walking around making these deals store by store by store. So you could kind of deal with 7-Eleven, if I'm remembering right, about half the 7-Eleven stores are corporate owned, the others are franchises. So you're making a deal with them, you're making a deal mainly with the, the corporates, you know, the ones that could follow the, the planogram. So, you know, I, I think the world we're talking about um, is uh, the large chains and when you get down to like the, the the corner the corner store and all, that's a different thing. That's you know Budweiser or Coca Cola coming in and buying signage, and so you can buy your way into those stores. But I, I the the practicality of of negotiating you know one off deals for single stores means that no one's really they're they're, they're not part of this placement fee world. Yeah, and I've also heard, Gary, that, you know, sometimes they'll give, um, some of these companies give racks and uh, coolers to, to these stores, and then it's sort of their territory to control. And the delivery crews certainly claim parts of the store as their own, even in the small, small stores. Right, right, that's, that's what I meant. Go ahead. Yeah, there are a number of questions we've gotten about regulation, and I think some ideas for the next report we should do <laughs> together, including several questions about other countries and whether other countries forbid these types of fees or whether there's a comparison with other industrial nations in terms of practice and diversity of products. And I think that would be really interesting. It's certainly outside of the scope of this report, but um, maybe the next thing along. The last question we'll ask before wrapping up um, is when you were doing this report, did you find that any communities regulate fees or slotting or required disclosure, um, or was it all hidden behind closed doors? Yeah, I was actually looking for that, thinking like, is there any place? The, the uh, equivalent would be Safeway. You know, this is one place where you know they were revealing uh, numbers. So I was actually keenly looking for. For that, you know, talking to various people out there, do they exist? No, I did not find uh, any place in the United States that where, where these kind of numbers are are um, those requirements to be reported. Yeah, and um, CSPI isn't aware of that either. If anyone participating in today's webinar has seen that, we'd love love more information. But I think that this is largely left to um, private actors to do what they want to negotiate deals. Uh, 
run their stores and their businesses the way they want without any kind of um, interference or intervention from the government. So it's a big, interesting, um, and kind of scary world. Thank you for your introduction to it, Gary. We appreciate your hard work on the report, and we want to thank everybody who joined today's webinar. We have recorded the webinar, so we will be sending out a link to that. If you have colleagues who missed it, um, feel free to share the recording with them. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.